We're in the middle of a series. I forgot to have Paul play Taylor Swift music before the prelude, but hopefully we can make that happen next week. We are in a series, The Gospel According to Taylor Swift, and I wanted to say a note about prepositions so no one gets nervous. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Taylor Swift, right? Like the gospel of Jesus Christ according to John or Mark or Matthew, etc. So I'm not saying that Taylor Swift is the gospel, but some of her uh, words can help us maybe enter into the gospel of Jesus Christ in a new way. And so the quote today that you find on the front of your bulletin is, And darling, it was good, never looking down, and right there where we stood was holy ground. Right there where we stood was holy ground. This is one of the things that I love about Taylor Swift. She can take a moment that is as simple as remembering someone fondly, which is what she's doing in this song uh, called Holy Ground on the album Red, and pull out the beauty and sacredness and just wonder of it. In fact, there's a whole TikTok account that did a series uh, on, I think it's called, In English We Say, But Taylor Swift Says This. So I wanted to pull out a couple of those for you. In English We Say, It was cold, so you gave me your sweater. But Taylor Swift says, November flush and your flannel cure. Right? Oh, so much more sacred. In English we say, you made me feel good again. But Taylor Swift says, and when I felt like I was an old cardigan under someone's bed, you put me on and said I was your favorite. In English, we say, the relationship didn't work out. But Taylor Swift says, we were blind to unforeseen circumstances. We learned the right steps to different dances. Oh, that's a good one. I know. (laughs) Taylor, or in English, we say, I'm grieving. Taylor Swift says, no words appear before me in the aftermath. Salt streams out of my eyes and into my ears. Everything I touch becomes sick with sadness. In English, we say, the city is full of people and energy. And Taylor Swift says, walking through the crowd, the village is aglow. Kaleidoscope of loud heartbeats under coats. Everybody here wanting something more, searching for a sound we hadn't heard before. It's pretty good, yeah. Am I making any Swifties as I go? Okay, yes, I have one. <laughs> Taylor's, in English we say, I don't trust her. I don't trust them. Taylor Swift says, I bury hatchets, but I keep maps of where I put them. <laughs> in English we say, you broke my heart. Taylor Swift says, I would have died for your sins. Instead, I just died inside. And you deserve prison, but you won't get time. Back to our original song that our quote comes from. In English, we say, I was thinking fondly of you. Taylor Swift says, I was reminiscing back to a first glance feeling on New York time, back when you fit into my poems like a perfect rhyme. Beautiful, right? And I know, I know, it's not just Taylor Swift that does this, right? I know Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan, Beyonce, we could go on and on. But there's something about whoever your favorite artist is that can take something really ordinary and pull out the holiness of it. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody want to shout out a favorite artist that does that for you? I don't want to hog the whole time for Taylor. Anybody? (laughs) Okay, well, we'll hog. Oh, Mick Jagger. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) Good, well, thank you for not booing uh, my Taylor Swift quotes today. Yeah, poetry, no matter who it comes from, maybe it's a, or, or even art or narrative, can help us see the beauty and sacredness of the ordinary, right? That right where we stood was holy ground. And I think uh, Taylor knows that, and so does Moses in our story today, and so does our poet who tells the narrative of Scripture, 
right? Moses' story is just as convoluted and up and down as Taylor's, maybe more so. Well, let, definitely more so, let's say that. But he's brought up in a royal house. He's got a lot of privilege. He wakes up to his people's oppression, right? Just a quick run through. Then he goes and murders someone who was one of the oppressors and has to run away and hide. So he is not in his place of privilege. He is not in the Holy Land. He is not where his ancestors were. He's a, an immigrant in Midian in the scene that we read about him standing on holy ground. God appears to Moses in the most ordinary place, right? A bush <laughs> in the wilderness. We often know Moses as the one who leads the people to the Holy Land, right? Or almost there. He doesn't get quite there. But God says years before, take off your shoes because right where you're standing, that is holy. That is holy. Everywhere is holy. Everything is holy. This is the thread throughout scripture that we hang on to and follow. And it takes us to Isaiah 66 that we read again and, and the um, copycat version in Acts. Heaven is my throne, God says. The earth is my footstool. What can you build me that is going to be special? It's all mine, God says. All things are mine. Everything is holy. And that thread continues into the life and work of Jesus, right? Who does most of his ministry outside of the holy religious places, right? Outside of the bounds of the holy religious people. No religious paraphernalia required. And it continues on into the church, the early church with Stephen and Peter and all of those disciples figuring out nothing is unclean. No one is unclean. This is an expansion or maybe just a realization of God's expansiveness, of the holiness that is everywhere, God's grace and presence everywhere, in everything in us and everything around us, not limited to any particular people or place. Right there where we stood was holy ground. This was true for Moses. Uh, despite his many mistakes and regrets and wrong turns and cowardice and uncertainty. And so surely it's true for us too, right? If it's true for Moses, it's got to be true for us. And when we recognize it, when we recognize that right where we stand is holy, whether it's from the help of a burning bush or from the help of your favorite poet or songwriter— when we recognize that where we are is holy ground, created by God, soaked in God's presence, the divine invitation in that moment is not protect the holy bush, <laughs> right? It's not get it sanctified by a religious professional or even go out and take the world for God, right? God says, now that I have your attention, now that I've got you noticing me, Go and set my people free. <laughs> Rescue the people who are being oppressed. I hear the cries of those in pain. I'm coming down to save them. Come on, get in the car. We're going. <laughs> God's instructions, when we see God's holiness, is not about claiming what's ours or claiming what's God's. It's already all God's, right? God's instructions, God's invitation is not about claiming something. It's about freeing people. Always. Always. In Moses' story, the release from bondage is really literal. Releasing a people who are enslaved. And then once they are released from that enslavement, the release has to become spiritual too because these folks are uh, in bondage to their... Uh, religious practices as well, right? Those things are connected. Our physical liberation and our spiritual liberation are always connected. That could be a whole other sermon, but we won't do it right now. We know that we are meeting God. We know that we have seen the divine when we turn around and start setting people free, when we follow the instructions, when we know the assignments, right? This is our evidence of the divine in our midst. 
when we start setting people free from the lie that violence will save us, it's a lie, y'all, every time, from the fear of people, people who are made in God's image, who we've been trained and programmed to dehumanize, we've got to set ourselves and others free from that, y'all. When we set people free from the paralysis of feeling powerless, that's a hard one, right? But you are not powerless. You are peacemakers and you are blessed. There is no big moment to wait for. There is no perfectly carved understanding to gain. There is no perfectly developed gift that we need to uh, develop. And no amount of sacrifices that we make to those idols, because those are idols and we will burn ourselves out trying to make sacrifices to our own goodness and readiness and um, understanding and never actually follow God if we do that. There's no amount of sacrifice to those idols that will save us or get us ready. There is no special place or special people. God's anointing is all around you wherever you are, wherever you are, in every ordinary thing. Right where you stand is holy ground. Just who you are already is holy. Thanks be to God for the stories in scripture, for the poets, for the songwriters, for the artists who help us see that. To see that the world is aflame with the divine. Can we recognize it? Can you recognize it? Can you take off your shoes and hear God's voice and tremble? <laughs> Can you hear God's presence? Can you feel it rise up through the soles of your feet and into your heart and mind and voice? You're ready. Freeing you in your own mind and heart to free others. Can you feel it claiming you and all the earth as holy? Beloveds, right where you stand is holy ground. You don't need to wait for anything else. You don't need to be anyone else. God invites you now as you are to get in, start freeing people. May it be so. So be it. Amen.